So my name is Sisavon, and I was born in Laos. As a, I like to start as an undergrad, was a lot about displacement identity, but is a li little bit more literal. And um, in graduate school, I really started talking more about being a mom. So one thing I always like to say to my students was, don't have a kid in graduate school. It's cheaper, but <laughs> it's a lot of work. And so, um, but uh, it, it was the most amazing thing. So yes, yeah, so I've been working at MTSU really for about 15 years now. And as I'm working, I think always the question that I like to bring up is, when do you have time to make art? And, um, and so one thing that I like to tell you a little bit about is that I have a friend named Aaron Amphison who's also a colleague, and we get together almost every Friday for two hours, and we call it SUMA. It basically is shut up and make art. And so these pieces kind of started out that way. And um, because we're both professors, I started out with these collages. And the collages were based off of some of my own travels in Laos and in Thailand, um, but also uh, images from the Vietnam War. And so I would take these images and make these um, collages and then take them apart and then um, Photoshop them and created a larger scale that really talked about debris and smoke and um, uh, crumbling facades and just the aftermath of war. And so, um, so from this little summa, uh, shut up and make art on Fridays, this is what came about. So I always tell my students, there's no reason why you don't have time to make art. You just have to, even if it's just two hours. My work, I hope, uh, is to continue on that path and really speak abstractly. I like to always think about, as an artist like Maya Len, who makes works that are just primarily about, you know, you, you see it, it's for the Vietnam War and they're just names, right? But then next to that, about 20 feet away, are these bronze sculpture. And I felt as though I couldn't represent representationally an image of how it feels to be an immigrant because it, it is very disorienting. Um, I don't think a lot of people understand that unless they have grown up in, a, like, a, you know, being Laotian and trying to assimilate to the American culture. So this is how I feel. This is how a lot of people feel. And yes, it's abstract. And yes, I want you to engage with it. And, um, and um, I'm definitely not being discreet with it. So um, the work is done. Uh, on acrylic because of the immediacy of it and um, because I also teach and I advise and I run the whole painting area and I just stay very busy. So I, I do use acrylic for that nature because that is so quick and that, um, that I can get work done as quick as possible. I love oils, I love the nostalgia of oils, but I realized that really wasn't the medium for it. Um, I can see these pieces later on maybe becoming larger sculpture pieces uh, and so that's, that's, sometime, that's something for me to kind of think of for the future um, in terms of where this work might be going towards. Uh, but in terms of the bright colors, some of the colors are talking a lot about... Uh, my mom was a, a weaver, and so that was an inspiration for that, was the colors, because if you look at Laotian textiles, they're very bright. They're almost kind of like South American colors as well. And so um, they're bright, they're saturated, they're, you know, again, they're not subtle. Uh, and so definitely the colors are responding to um, the history of my, my mom being a weaver and uh, as we were also farmers. Um, so yeah, so these pieces, you know, I think of them as, uh, and these jagged edges, I thought that was really important that it wasn't just uh, done by you know, really nice vertical or just horizontal and they're flat because I wanted that jagged edge and to really feel that tension um, in the space and also, uh, and, and really play with the reflection as well. And so that, that was important. Um, but yeah, so I think that, I think the questions I always have for myself is like, maybe, you know, how much bigger? Does it need to get bigger? Should it be mural size? I mean, you know, that's, that's something, right, as a painter that maybe, you know, I, I would like to see. I, I don't know if it's something that I really have time for. I do like the scale of the work and just because it's modular. And initially it was really modular because I was, uh, it was easier to fit into my husband's truck. And so some of you students out there, I'm very practical. And um, being practical is important because 
if these don't sell or they don't go anywhere, they're in, I don't have a storage space, so um, they're in my front room. And, um, and I'm okay with that. And so, but I, the other thing is that I also think about them as being kind of nomadic, because immigrants and refugees kind of move around and, uh, and, you know, and also questioning home. They can be picked up and then put into another spot. And I thought that was very important as well um, in a very symbolic way. Uh, and so, but the work in itself is, is definitely modular, it's transportable, and um, this, the reflection of uh, what it means to be in America, you know, and, and just being able to pick up yourself and move, uh, but that's, that's the way it is. When I was a kid, we moved around a lot, not because of the army, it was actually because of Krispy Kreme. It's a really good reason to move around. I didn't make a lot of friends, so mainly I had my family, and my cousin was really into drawing like bubble letters and Tweety Bird, and I decided that that was the thing I was going to be better than her at. I was going to draw better than her, because she was much better at volleyball and more important things, so I started drawing a lot. I um, wasn't super into reading, but then I uh, found comics and manga, and uh, started to realize that I was really into storytelling that involved imagery and words and the different ways that you could tell a story with that medium. So in middle school, I asked for my only Christmas present to be a Wacom drawing tablet. I'm old, it was an Intuos 2. Um, if any of you guys are into drawing tablets, I don't know. Um, so I started drawing terrible anime fan art and posting on my Deviant Art account. This is a confessional. Um, and from that, I started to try and make my own comics. Made them in notebooks, because that's how you get published, is drawing everything in a lined notebook paper. Um, and I started showing them off and realized that I couldn't write. So all through high school, I already had half of these characters made in high school and uh, I was trying to make a zombie story, because that's what I was into, deterioration, stuff like that, it's really into that. And um, so I set off on trying to find a writing partner, and uh, through tons of heartbreak through high school, loss of friendships, and uh, just turmoil, I realized that I couldn't find anyone, so I went to UTC, for a painting and drawing degree, and I decided not to show anyone my illustration work. I was going to be a real painter, and uh, the plan was to draw de deteriorating buildings and work at Michael's in the frame shop, and that was going to be my life. But I kept the dream alive, I kept trying to find a writing partner, and um, I worked up the nerve to talk to somebody in uh, the English department to ask them if they knew anyone that was looking for a art partner to work on comics. And they told me, no, no one wants to make comics, leave. And I did, I was heartbroke, but still wrote. I decided uh, to then finally confess, this is my junior year, confess to my painting teacher, Ron Buffington, that I was secretly an illustrator and this took a lot of, a lot of like pumping myself up secretly. I'm not just into painting. I also do this. And uh, he didn't understand why I didn't tell him in the first place and why I hadn't been doing that since the beginning. So I realized there actually wasn't much of a difference between what I was doing and it was just kind of a mental barrier more than anything else. So I started working on figurative illustration work for my final year and started printing my work, um, got into making cheap art, lots of digital prints, and then um, I got into Four Bridges, the art festival over there at the pavilion. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, and I wanted to make t-shirts because that was what felt like was the, the next progression was to to make fiber art. And um, so I got in touch with Nick Dupay, young monster, and talked to him about making t-shirts and 
got really pumped because he was like, yeah, if you print them for yourself, you can do it for cheap. And I was like, yes, art student, I want that. So I realized I'm not good at the squeegee part, but I am pretty good at cleaning screens off. It took way longer. His girlfriend at the time, uh, now wife, Allie Burke, came in with beer, and he was actually the one that initiated our uh, our collaboration. He was like, you write, you do art, you guys do stuff. And then we did. So we started meeting, and I showed my terrible script to uh, to her, and we realized that we didn't need another Walking Dead. So we started to rebuild the story. Thankfully, she was okay with keeping some of these characters that I'd grown very, very attached to. And we decided that we wanted to make a hopeful post-apocalyptic story, a story about rebuilding after the apocalypse and make it more character-driven and not make it something that's super, like, kill off everybody, sad times, kind of like Walking Dead. Um, so we worked on that. I graduated. And... Um, Let's see, I got to the middle of the third chapter, and she moved to Boston. It's heartbroken again, but the internet, we were able to still collaborate. I moved to Atlanta because I thought with my painting and drawing degree, I could become a graphic designer in a town that has a lot of schools that graduate graphic designers. It was real smart. And then, uh, let's see, so I, I worked a lot of odd jobs down there just to keep my rent. And then after about three years down there, I realized I needed to actually go back to school again. And then came back up here because I'd already done all those core classes at UTC. Super smart. And got my graphic design degree. And right after, I realized that um, I had lost one of the pages in the middle of chapter three. And I did not want to redraw it. So it took me a long time to get back into drawing it just because of that one page. But after graduation, I was like, yeah, I better get back on that. And um, I decided the main goal was going to be to just make the first volume and see what happened after that. We did a Kickstarter for it <laughs> and managed to get it printed. And I started doing the convention circuit. We started going to all these conventions and realizing that like the amount of creativity at these conventions was really, really intoxicating. It made you want to start creating. And once you get back, it's kind of draining to realize you have to go back to your day job. It turns out graphic design is not my passion and I'd really rather be doing this all the time. So the uh, big step forward, what I wanted to do to keep the creative juices alive was to create a community where other illustrators and writers could get together and collaborate. Since I couldn't find a collaborating partner for so long, I wanted to help others. So that's where the Chat Comics Co-op came to be uh, through a lot of other people as well, of course, Infinity Flux and every other supporting member. But that's... Uh, that's pretty much about it. I prefer to call myself a painter and an artist. People say you're the art, the artist in the family, and and um, I, no, I'm I just I'm a painter. I paint pictures, and uh, my work is all about the process. You know, not so much any idea really initially behind it, but. Maybe some ideas come through the work as the work um, pro progresses on the easel. I paint on an easel. I built it myself. And, well, okay, just back up a minute. I may be a little tang tangential, tangential. They're all oil on canvas. Um, I, I, I don't think I've ever painted with anything other than oils, maybe acrylic, when I was younger. and. In school, you know, you experiment with different things, but I just love the the, the, the smell of oil paint and and and, and maybe it, when I was a child, um, my grandfather he wasn't a um, an art an artist painter, but he did on the weekends. He loved the arts, and he had this studio set up in the sunroom, and it, the smell of the the um, turpentine. You no, know, then they used these real 
odorous chemicals to paint with, but I love, I love the, the smell of that now. It's odorless mental spirits. You, um, um, where was I? Right, oil on canvas. <laughs> um, uh, these three, I think I had going when, when Nandini came up to talk to them about being in the show, but they didn't look anything like they do today. I want to say this had originally um, started as a bit of my stairwell going up the old studio. I used to work in a studio apartment. Now I have a little building I work on to the side, and there was a stairwell going up to my loft, and, 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 and that was where this painting started. You can kind of see it has nothing to do with the stairwell now, and these are sort of the way that these paintings progress. Ideas just come out of the work. Maybe I see something in a, a shape, a, a, an accidental shape or drip that reminds me of something, and I push and, and pull um, things out, and it's um, a lot of just editing and knowing what to keep because I have a lot of really, I say it all the time, but um, really corny ideas in my paintings, and I just kind of weed them out. Um, and and, 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 um, and these, these three together, these two here, I just feel a little differently because I, I have a lot of work from graduate school that um, was terrible. They, you know, they push you to like, paint, 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 you know, like, the more paintings, the better. And I don't really um, follow that philosophy today. I think we don't. We have enough crap in the world. We don't need more of it. We need fewer, better things, or whatever better means. Fewer things that maybe mean something more to me. And 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 I get to that point by by working more on them, not just quicker chunk it onto the next one. Maybe it's a good learning process when you're young and in graduate school to paint more and more and, 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 and never drawing something to a finish. Um, but be the, because of that, I have all these paintings, these old canvases, and, and many times I'll you know, I break them down and I'll cut them up, right? And I have all the texture from the old paintings there, right? You can um, and so sort of recycle these old, paint, these old paintings. And I love working on that. Paintings that have this old paint texture underneath it. Somehow, I, I, the, the paint acts differently. It gets denser and richer in some way that I can't. I mean, I'm sure I could get to it with the raw canvas, but it would be so time-consuming to get to that that point. Um, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I eventually run out of old um, um, uh, grad school paintings um, to paint on. I, I do have some more recent work at the house that's been out in the world and maybe came back. Uh, it, nobody wanted to um, purchase it or need it in any way, so it's back at the house. And, and um, I have them hanging there. And I, I, they irritate me in a lot of ways, um, these paintings do. So maybe one day they'll wind up on the chopping block, um, too. But some of them are really nice in their own way, too. They, you, know, you know, paintings are weird. You paint them, and then they go away, and then you see them again, and, and, and you don't know what to make of them anymore. Um, they, they're one thing in the studio. They're another thing in the gallery. And then they, you know, they, as time passes, um, something changes with them. One thing I'll just point out here, this, this right here, that, um, this foot, I could not, I don't know why I'm talking about this, I guess because I'm supposed to be saying something, but I could not get this foot to work, to work right when you paint a foot in that particular, um, the frontal profile, right, when all the features are just compressed into like this club. Um, it's really frustrating. So I threw a, I threw a sock on the foot. I, I, it's, uh, <laughs> I always say I love Lucian Freud, and people are like, you don't, you don't love me anything Lucian Freud, but he was a big hero of mine. I, I, I remember I, I had never heard or seen any of his work, and I was in New York visiting a friend of mine who lived on Islip and Islip on the Long Island, and um, we went to the the uh, Met, and I saw this. He had, he had this huge retrospective, and I was just like. Floored people painting figures. I, you just don't see that in um, school. I, so it always had a, 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 a lasting effect on me, and I'm, I'm done.
I'm done. I don't have anything else to say. I don't, I don't, I don't think. So uh, I guess uh, all artwork or good artwork is supposed to come from some type of tragedy uh, and or some type of fissure in your life. Well, actually, and, uh, I had a really good um, uh, instructor when I was younger, this guy Larry Anderson. If anybody um, lived in Atlanta or spent a lot of time in Atlanta, uh, he was an um, instructor at the Atlanta College of Art for many years. And he said that, uh, you know, you live the first 18 years of your life, and if you're an artist, you're going to make work about that first 18 years for the rest of it. Um, and I guess that's kind of true for all of us, and I kept thinking about that as we were listening to everybody um, here uh, this evening. So for me, uh, I, you know, I grew up in New York City. Well, I grew up in, in Queens. And um, my big tragedy was moving away um, from that place uh, when I was a teenager uh, and uh, moving to Sarasota, Florida. So uh, that, that in itself wasn't, well, no, that was awful. Um, but, um, <clears throat> I mean, it is for anybody when they're moving um, at that time, I think, in their life. Uh, so, because you're moving away from your family, at least I was. And it came, became more and more central to me and my work and who I was um, as I progressed as an artist. And I, I didn't stay in Florida for, for all that long. I moved to, um, to Atlanta, and I... I I went to school and I became a painter, supposedly. And then um, I, uh, uh, at the end of my studies over there, I had this experience that really changed me. Is that I went to I went to Australia, uh, of all places, a place I never really thought that I was going to visit in my life. Um, and maybe some of the maybe that's like the best type of place because uh, the surprise the surprises in your life are are really kind of wonderful and jarring. And this one was. Um, so it was this program called Art in the Outback. And we went all around Australia and saw all this um, native art that was there. And it really made a huge impression on me. I was out um, in an aboriginal um, uh, place um, in the Northern Territory. And uh, I was young and naive. And I remember um, walking around with a native there, and um, I kept asking him, you know, what things were called in his, his language, and he kept, I point at something, and uh, I say, like, what's that over there? And he say, dubda. And then I point to something else, and he say, dubda. And then I point to something else, I'd be like, okay, how about that, how about that tree? I, get, I was getting really frustrated. I was like, how about this? And he said, dubda. And then I got back, and I was all frustrated. I was like, it's like, what's going on? Like, this guy, you know, I kept asking him. I just really wanted to learn the language. And all I kept saying, you know, I, I asked him what things were, and he said they were dubbed And he said, well, that's your fingertip. And <laughs> I realized, um, I think at that moment, or at least I at least like to think that I realized that moment, of just how little I knew, um, how inaccessible um, that... Um, uh, that environment was through um, my relationship with that person, um, how much I needed to reflect on myself. Um, and, uh, and then when I went into the museums in Sydney and I saw all this stuff that was made by um, the natives there um, behind glass and also removed, it really got me thinking. And I started to, uh, in my mind, uh, come up with a plan to design my own museum. Um, and that museum somehow, over the years, because I've been working on this for like 15 years now, has been a way for me to recreate, I think, some of those experiences when I was younger, um, and also some of the criticisms that I had about the museum uh, and how they framed things as well. So I have different wings to this museum, different areas. There's like a prehistory area. I mean, that actually turned out to be one of the larger ones, but that was also one of my first experiences um, was with being really inspired by uh, prehistoric, or not pre, pre, prehistory work. 
Uh, so I got a lot of work to do. Um, it's a, it's, I guess it's kind of a life work to make the museum. And I honestly don't even really know what it'll actually look like in the end or where it will be housed or if it'll actually really be housed anywhere. Um, it, it is somewhat fictional, but work does exist from this museum. Um, this is one of them over here, and so is this um, behind me. Well, we can't necessarily connect with this, with history in such a deep way, at least the way we like to think we could. Like as if you were to like study it hard enough, if you were to look at it just the right way, you'd be able to deduct some type of reasonable um, truth or assumptions about that time period. Um, I, and I just have decided to give away with that altogether. And, and instead, I am just making artwork that is purely about my fantasies about that history. And also, I recognize I spent a lot of time fantasizing about uh, the people that were in front of me in my early experiences in the museum. And I just wanted to make artwork that reflected that. And I started just, instead of trying to replicate um, Aboriginal history, um, I decided I was going to act it out in my studio. And so I just like, I, I took off all my clothes and I maybe put on like a loincloth and I would just make these stances and do this, you know, motions of getting attacked by tiger. Anything that would be out of my imagination about uh, those places and those times that are so far away, ungraspable, and just impenetrable. Um, I realized um, that I was very frustrated um, with those drawings, um, and I ended up crumbling one of them up, and I threw it on the ground, and then I was like, hey, that looks like a, that looks like a cave, kind of, you know, the crumbled rock form. Looks a little bit like a, you know, like a rock formation. Um, and then I just, I saw that figure sitting on there that I drew, and I cut it out, and I stuck it up next to it, and I was just like, yeah, that's a diorama. That's the, that could be my, my, you know, prehistory diorama. And I loved how the, humble, how the humbleness of the paper came out in that. It, it was small, it, it was as insignificant as I felt my imagination really was. Um, it's nothing, you know, there's nothing special about it, really. I mean, we all have it, um, and I wanted to be honest about that in my work. But beyond that, I wanted to make a drawing series that would expand upon the cut figures that were here. So I would cut text, like a lot of these texts are um, ethnographic journals, like, and honestly, things I'm very critical about. Um, and they'd be about like the Marindanum and uh, Papua, New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, a lot of, um, I'm interested in a lot of uh, Papua New Guinean um, prehistory and, uh, and current history. And um, then, uh, and there's like a lot from the, the San people, uh, also known as the Bushmen in um, South Africa. And I, I wanted to take those and expand upon those um, in drawings and keep making more and more references and including um, further reference material, like almost as if the drawing was like a big visual citation of the work that I was making here. I, I was interested in how um, uh, a lot of the figures that I end up drawing are um, of me, um, and I guess that it makes sense because it's my imagination, and I, um, uh, you can see a lot of portraits, um, you can see some images of, um, of figures getting attacked, um, similar to what's going on over here, and I don't know, that just happened to be what came out in my head when I'm, like, when I'm looking at all this material, and uh, it's interesting that it, I'm always in a fight, and so many, um, uh, of my work, but the f the, I rarely am fighting somebody else. It's usually just some kind of either animal or it looks like there's somebody being attacked um, or there's somebody looking kind of sad and um, uh, uh, concerned. Uh, I have a lot of 
images uh, that I reincorporated from modern art as well, because I was recognizing how much of, um, of modern art uh, was a re reflection on, 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 on prehistory, um, that that was very much um, the, the, uh, the school of uh, primitivism. And um, I know how significant um, Gauguin was in that, so you have actually a, a large um, piece of his, actually a few works of his, um, intermixed um, with some of the, of the history that he was, or the, the, the people that he was um, uh, amongst um, when he was uh, doing his paintings. And, um, and then you have uh, some uh, objects over here, some, these, I can, we can point down over here. These objects, which were drawn from uh, stitch work that were from fabric that you would see in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And uh, I'd be looking at those images all the time. Like, I loved the patterns that, that would happen uh, within the ceremonial garbs that they would have there. And so I decided I was going to cut those out, but more in this kind of sculptural form, in a way like where the figure would look like they're almost worshiping this thing. Um, I don't know what that means, um, but for some reason I felt like I needed to make that. And a lot of the things that people are interested in is the process of, the, of these, and I, I, I just, I end up just drawing the figures first, and then I cut them out um, uh, from those sheets of paper with my hand. I don't use like a laser cutter or anything like that. Um, each piece usually takes about like 30 minutes or so, and, uh, and then I prop each one up uh, with, um, with a little bit of model glue. And uh, a lot of times I just really enjoy just the, the setting up. Um, everything happens inside of the museum itself, and it feels to me a lot like um, like, a, like I'm playing with these things, so on top of um, the fantasy that I would have in the studio making the things, I'm also just like going back into this very kind of playfulness um, when, I'm, when I'm setting the things up as well. Uh, and um, yeah, I think, that, does that sound like enough? I'm not sure what time I am at right now, but uh, that, that it feels like the right time to stop, so I'm gonna stop now.